only two board members not on. <laughs> We've already <laughs> pledged. Don't hop up there. Yes. You two have to do your own separate <laughs> pledge of allegiance. Yes. I don't know. I have an official I time of 729. Is this, I did it today. is this real? This is real. You're late. Sorry. Um, good? Okay. Um, is there any member of the public who would like to speak? Okay. Um, student representatives report. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Um, so, two Fridays ago was our school spirit day, uh, and we had our pep rally. It was a lot of energy. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I heard, I'm not a senior, but I heard that the senior picnic went extremely well, and uh, the wake-up call was great, the band marching through the halls. Um, the football team has won two games by blowing out the other team uh, against NDUS Haven in Middletown. Uh, back to school night was extremely att attended, uh, like more than past years. And uh, all the fall sports are in full swing, so we invite you guys to come and watch. Uh, and all of the school year has started off with a big bang and a lot of positive energy. Thank you. Eric, you may not have the answer to this, but did the fall play start rehearsals yet? Do you know? Oh, was I it announced know that they were doing? No, no. I don't know. That. I'm not sure yet. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it was announced I don't, yet. Yeah. I, don't know. I think that they're still deciding on what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, superintendent's report. Are you ready to Mrs. Dolly Um, Sure. <laughs> That's not a ringing endorsement. Yes, I am. Um, okay. So the last meeting we had um, a review of the uh, strategic plan, and in general we had a review of the outcome indicators that we had that our measurements. Um, out of the nine that we had identified in the plan, we went through seven of them. Some of them rather in depth, uh, parent satisfaction survey, the alumni survey, and so forth. Uh, today we're just going to do an overview of the process uh, strategic objective, which would be the ones that kind of lead us to our outcomes uh, as part of the strategic plan. Here we go. <laughs> and um, what we would like to do is then spend the next meeting just with recommendations for changes uh, for some updates of the plan and then any input from the board for that two weeks to, to consider the strategic plan. So this is our strategy map. And as you can see, the top three, the stakeholder outcomes, in, in each of those three, there are three outcome <coughs> measures. We went through those the last meeting just to refresh our memory. And below that, we have our strategic objectives. Uh, we've color-coded them to say which ones we are comfortable with that are on track. Um, we have a couple that are slightly off track, and we have two that are screaming in red saying we have to do something about that. So um, the administrative team wants to come back with, we already have some suggestions at our next meeting, um, and make some changes to those two strategic objectives. And we also want to have conversations with, with board members about any other um, objectives in there that we want to have some uh, changes towards for this year. Um, a lot of these objectives are multi-year objectives, uh, so the, the work continues on track, uh, but two in particular that we want to highlight for some changes. So Gail, do you want to go through and start clicking? Sure. Okay. So the scorecard itself is pretty simple. On the far left uh, was that map of the objectives. In the middle are the individual measures that we use for each. And on the far right, that column, are the individual initiatives to support each objective. It is already. Yeah, well, it's, um, so Seth asked a good question if you post on the website. So we have our strategic plan posted, mm -hmm. but when we go live with uh, we have the changes in the data and so forth that'll all be adjusted. I'm just asking because the odd room yeah, set the up, camera the camera can't yeah, see the yes. board. So, so it is it is online and, and, and the adjustments will be online as well. Thank you. Gail, yeah, you want to walk us through the first so, one? Yeah, so, um, sorry, this is a little slow, so I apologize. Um, I tried to open up everything before. So this is um, looking at whole child. Uh, this is one of our indicators for whole child development. And I think I flashed this up quickly at our last board meeting. Um, this is the percentage of students participating in at least one extracurricular activity. And you can see a breakdown by school. Um, so that was one of the ways that we looked at um, that indicator. The other indicator for cultivating whole child development 
is um, to take a look at our settings, um, classrooms, and we really looked at um, a set of criteria and looked at um, how those settings supported developmentally appropriate um, instruction. And I believe this is the right one. So again, I'm sorry if it's slow. They were all open, so I was hoping I was tricking this and moving along. So we created a criteria uh, at the leadership level where we would be able to look at a classroom setting and say, is that setting, no, it's the whole child wellness team, and Becky just coincidentally is here, and she led that work, um, a criteria by which we can judge the classroom to say whether or not it was actually a uh, developmentally appropriate setting. And then we did classroom walkthroughs over the course of the year, and then took data to say which ones met the criteria and which ones didn't. Um, and we were able to track that data over the course of the year. I think you have right there, yeah. That's it, yeah. So you could see that our administrators went around with a very distinct checklist that was um, developed by the whole child wellness team. Um, and members of the team also participated and they determined the percentage of spaces that met all four <coughs> criteria. So you can see a breakdown of that criteria. Um, our next uh, strategic, strategic objective was to um, look at developing a dynamic and engaging curriculum. And there were a number of units that were um, adopted per discipline, and that was approved by our Curriculum Review Council, which has a different set of criteria, as well as adopted by the board. And so far, um, 681 units have been approved by the board in um, a number of different content areas, and you'll see a map of the years and the amount of units that have been adopted. And again, those units are developed with uh, teachers around the table, um, looking at current content standards and also looking at the criteria for the district to embed and incorporate 21st century skills. Um, so these are all of the disciplines and courses that have had adopted curricular units. Um, our next <coughs> objective was to really look at providing the highest quality instruction for all students. This was another one where we kind of did a homegrown approach for criteria to set, uh, to hold us accountable to the type of instruction in the classrooms. So we came up with uh, a tool for classroom walkthroughs. We conducted these walkthroughs at each of, the, each of the schools and all the levels. And then as we did the walkthroughs, we kept track of the data to say, um, was there evidence of high quality instruction in the classroom or was there not? Um, you can see the pie chart here and, and the bar graph. Yeah, I, I can't read that from here, so I'm going to read that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so we did 81 spontaneous classroom visits across the district, um, and we took a look at whether or not we saw that indicator in the moment of that visit. So it could have been a four-minute round that we did, and one of them might have been um, students referring back to the instructional objectives. So if we didn't observe it in that moment, um, then we would put not observed. It didn't mean that it wasn't necessarily evident. Um, if we were sure that we should have observed it, um, you could see 9% is a no, 69% is a yes. So uh, that bottom question in this pie is can the students articulate what they are learning and why? 69% um, yes, 22% not observed, 9% no. Do the instructional activities align to the objectives? 91% yes. Did the teacher check for understanding throughout the lesson? 93% yes. Is there a balance between students and teachers working and talking? In other words, active engagement. And that was 93% yes. This goes hand in hand with the series of um, professional development that um, our administrators delivered to teachers throughout the course of a two-year period. So this was our, our check to see whether or not it was translating back into the classroom. Our next um, objective was to really look at processes and um, whether or not we were engaging as a district and in buildings um, in a very specific a uh, set of criteria called the Plan, Do, Study Act, the PDSA cycle. Um, and we looked at these feedback loops in order to make sure that we were, um, that we were double checking uh, with initiatives that we might have put in place or problems that we were trying to solve. We get asked quite often, so you, you, you put this in place, you purchased this, you did this, how do you know it worked? 
So we put these little feedback loops in place. Some of them are idiosyncratic, and some of them are more around initiatives. Some of them are instructional, some are cultural. Um, you know, something as simple as um, the cell phone policy at, uh, at Polson. You put this in place, how do you know it really made a difference? Did it work? And so we put these little, these little loops in place, and I have monthly meetings with each principal, and we have conversations um, about how they're tracking um, those continuous improvement loops on anything. And you can see it's a wide range here. Um, high expectations teaching 2.0 is a, a big, lofty um, instructional approach and something as small as at hand where we knew we had a, an issue with and have an issue across the country with vaping. So we put some measures in place and how do you know it's working? So um, you know, at this point it was creating a baseline um, for this year and we have them up there and we'll continue to work on some of those this year and then also add as we go forward. I just want to add that um, just because it's uh, one line in this, it doesn't mean that it didn't take place over a series of many meetings. So usually a plan, do, study, act uh, uh, component would uh, take at least a sequence of five meetings in order to really look at that particular initiative and to analyze what was happening. Um, let's see. So um, the next one was really talking about um, how well do we communicate individual and district performance. Um, I believe the board has seen this a few times, so I'm just going to quickly uh, flash that up if there is such a thing. And this is uh, straight on the district website. So we showed it to the board a few, few months ago, and we actually put a series of videos um, and the dashboard itself up on the website. That's a great shot of time. That's awful. That's just <laughs> wonderful. That's you will never awful. see my face in the video. You will hear my voice, but never see my face. Um, so this is really um, making sure that the public can also understand our Madison Performance Dashboard. And uh, again, it's very transparent and it walks the public through what we mean when we say Performance Dashboard. Um, so that's right on the website. So we've actually completed uh, the development of that system. It doesn't mean that we can't improve upon it next year. Yeah, can you see how many people actually tap into that? No, you know, actually, that was a question about curriculum, too, is how many hits can we judge how many hits we're getting to that? You know, all I have is anecdotal information, other districts calling in and saying, hey, we saw. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't have a way to track how much is. Let's check with Rita. I don't really track the hits. You do have a counter on both of those YouTube videos, having watched them both. Oh, there's a counter on the bottom? Yes. YouTube. How many was there on the left? Seven now? Three. <laughs> 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 that high. After tonight, it's going to go way up. Man, <laughs> is, is this outside anywhere else? That's because your video is going to be telling you. So good. But it's that you should be able to get yeah, it from yeah, Google yeah, Analytics. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and the on, you know? Yeah. So, another, so that was really looking at the milestones in the district performance dashboard, was really looking at that component that talked about district performance. But we also want to make sure we're communicating um, about individual student performance. And we have a, a separate initiative charter about the establishment of the individual reporting system. So last year, we were able to um, really work for the past year and a half on the development of K through five progress report cards. And uh, that took a, a huge amount of feedback from teachers, coaches, coordinators, um, and then we had a parent group that came in and actually gave us a ton of feedback. We had a huge group um, that really looked at the um, progress reports that we had in place and gave us feedback in order to improve those progress reports. So we're very proud to say that we will be using those progress reports whoops, um, this year, and that's not it. Um, this year in order to um, communicate with our K through five parents. So that will be going um, live. In addition, we will have our conferences K through five. So I'm just gonna open up a sample of a progress report or a report card uh, for grade four so you can see what that looks like. And again, our parents really helped us to um, closely develop this, but you'll see um, it be, well, you really can't see a lot. <laughs> Bottom center, can you hit the plus? Uh, yeah. Let's see, I don't know how clear that thing is. Is that any better? <laughs> yeah, a little a bit. One more, yeah. one more time. One more time. There you go. There you go. Okay, so you can see these large bands. Um, 
And they really have huge topical pieces that K through 12 we're <laughs> looking at. And then you could see smaller standards or outcomes that we're looking to measure. Uh, one of the pieces that the parents really gave us a lot of guidance on was the performance descriptors, um, really guiding us to have teachers identify strengths, developing needs expectation, needs time, and not introduced at this time. Um, so that was really helpful. In addition, we also included a lot more information from the related arts um, and also a comment section for related arts. And uh, the 21st century capacities, which are kind of those global pieces or those soft skills that we want students in order uh, to be able to integrate into learning and content and to be able to demonstrate regularly, those pieces will also be reported to parents in this new progress report. So there'll be a lot of writing to go along with that so parents understand what we're what they're looking at. Can I ask a question about that? Uh, if, if you can go back to the, if you can find that. Yes. Um, on the first page, is as you get to a more narrow difference between descriptions of performance, so I'm thinking about D and N in particular, developing mm. and needs time. Yes. Is there a, an operational definition or some kind of description that parents would be able to see about what's the difference between developing and needs mm. time, for example? There is. There is. So there is a descriptor that goes along with that. Okay. Um, Isn't there also a direct through line to the actual student um, work or evidence also that informs it? Well, each one of these indicators, each one of these boxes, right. has a translation guide <laughs> for teachers. So they're looking at the same um, indicators evidence. of performance and the same evidence in order to mark them. So whatever, um, whatever tasks students are given um, that are used to evaluate, I'm going to go to a content because it's a lot easier, um, what does using writer's notebook effectively look like? So there's a set of criteria that they would be looking for in order to mark that indicator. There would be uh, different uh, evidence or pieces of performance that they would use um, across a grade level in order to um, look at reading and look at math. And so we've identified those. That's teacher facing, it's in, teacher terms facing. Of, in terms of assigning the descriptor, but there's also a parent facing version of just the descriptors themselves and how. <coughs> and what they mean. And what they mean. Yeah. And th is that included with the report card? Uh, the progress it report is. The, the progress report, the first one that comes out, I'll have like a, a longer introduction right. than typically what you would see until people get used to it and get used to the philosophy of it. Um, but along with that, you will have that, that piece. Right. Actually, I thought we had it in the second page, but maybe we don't. Mm -hmm. Nope, I guess we don't. Yeah, that's a good question. But it is in there. It's already defined. I don't have the boxes for that, though. I can show you what that looks like. Um, okay, so um, down near the bottom, um, and I'm sorry, this little piece keeps popping up. Modernized facilities with learning spaces, that was one of those items that was um, in the yellow. And you'll see the bottom indicator here. We have 6.5% uh, complete against the 10-year CIP plan, and that the initiative charter to go with that was the facility subcommittee. And we also have a ratio of devices to students. Um, that's another trackable piece that we were doing. So let me see if I can find devices to students. Ah, look at that, how lucky. Um, <laughs> so here's our ratio of devices to students, and that was provided by Artsickle. So you'll see the, um, the Chromebooks, the iPads, um, against the student population. And you know that um, as students are entering ninth grade, we're initiating a one-to-one -one device um, piece. So we will be refreshing our plan um, this year around technology, and we'll be projecting forth for the next couple of years where we want to see those counts. The three-year plan for technology sunsets this June. Um, and then on the second page, there's two of them that you'll see that uh, P7 and P8, that stimulating innovative instructional methods. We had a huge amount of debate about what is innovative. 
and what quantifies innovation and when you replicate innovation. So that was one of our objectives that actually we coded red because we wanted to do a deeper dive with that and we wanted to actually do some more work on that. Um, so that's one that we don't have a lot of data for, but a lot of debate around, as well as we did a huge amount of uh, work around looking at internal motivation for the next indicator, which is looking at um, celebration of exemplary practices um, and the number of staff receiving recognition. So we really wanted to take a look at when external motivation plays um, a role in a company and when internal motivation trumps external motivation. So we're doing a deeper dive in that one as well. More to come next meeting. Um, so we had a few years back in one of our summer retreats, one of our priorities was to break down the barriers of grade levels and across <coughs> districts and we really wanted to deprivatize our practice. Um, so as a leadership group, we decided to um, really do uh, that focus both in our buildings and as a leadership council. So we have a number of meeting minutes focused on instructional practice. Um, so we looked at our meetings across buildings. And you could see we, we tracked the kinds of things that we felt were priorities in deprivatization of instructional practice. So we wanted to see how much time we were dedicating to analyzing student work, to unpacking curriculum units and talking about curriculum, and sharing of instructional practice. So that's uh, our baseline data. Um, we are hoping to grow that data. So that's time in minutes um, that we took a look at. And another way we took a look at that was across our leadership challenges at our admin council meetings. Um, we took a look at our problems of practice, is how we, what we describe it as, and we categorized which problems of practice were managerial, which ones were leadership challenges, and which ones were problems of practice that dealt with more systems. So you can see the bulk of our time is leadership problems of practice um, that we discussed in our forums in order to grow our practice as a leadership team. Can um, you define the problems of practice that yeah. you discovered? Every, every uh, two weeks, the entire administrative council meets uh, for a three-hour block, and they're standing agenda items. This is one of them. So um, in my monthly meetings, I may ask Becky, you know, we're, we're talking about something individually. Becky, would you put this on the table for this whole leadership team so we can kind of discuss this as a team? Um, and then what we find is that um, Becky may be having, um, you know, a, a leadership challenge around, say, one of the change initiatives. So while we work together as a team, someone else on the table is having a similar challenge, a different topic, they're learning from it, and they're also giving feedback to help her as well as a colleague. So it's a protocol that we put in place, is it three years now? Maybe? Three years. Yeah, three years. Mm -hmm. um, you like it, Becky? <laughs> Honestly, it's one of my favorite parts of our meetings because, you know, this is the real work in real time, and, you know, these kind of like case studies, if you will, yeah. you know, I'm usually taking feverish notes, <laughs> you yeah. know, of what did you do with that situation popped up, and um, they are, they're great learning moments for us. And so those principles. categories are some of the things, case studies that you discuss are administrative mm -hmm. issues, yep. some are, okay. Yep. We, we just gave them broad topics <coughs> because we wanted to kind of track and say, are we only dealing with managerial things or true leadership issues or systems issues? We wanted to make sure that we knew that, you know, we're paying attention <coughs> to not just the urgent, but the important. And that's what's mm -hmm. hard to do, because the urgent's always there, but can we really focus on the important work, which is improving instruction in classrooms and so forth? So, um, Tom, along those lines, does that pie chart tell you uh, the distribution? Mm -hmm. Are you ha happy with that distribution? Yeah, or do you I, want I'm, to I'm glad the, the leadership. Or? I was surprised because I don't. I put the item on the agenda, but I don't track it month by month, so I had no idea what to expect. And I was really pleased to see that you know a good. Over a half or so is around leadership issues, or around a half, and that, that's what we were hoping for. So you're coming? <coughs> yeah, you're yeah. Away. We don't want to spend a ton of time on. Well, why were the buses three minutes late today? Yeah. And you know, we want to talk about you know real media issues. We want to take care of those managerial issues quick, move on, and get to the media issues. So, but I, I'm I'm happy too that we talk about the health of the system yeah. in those mm -hmm. moments too. Yeah. That we take advantage of our, our time together to look after like what's working and what's. Um, 
clunky uh, across the system. So I think it um, and I feel it suffers from such isolationism from the smallest unit in the classroom to then to the buildings. It's easy as a teacher, you know, to be in your classroom and lost in the moment of just that one unit of the, of the whole system. And then as a principal, it's easy to think of this is my school, and you have to. But then you're part of a larger system, so it's good to do that kind of work. Our, our next objective is uh, around continuous improvement of our um, professional learning, and. Um, the PD calendar um, is developed um, with uh, some of the work on the subcommittees of the board and the board um, ultimately uh, votes it into play. But the, the professional development opportunities are um, not only costly in terms of time, but costly in terms of um, impact. So you want to make sure that your professional development is translating into classrooms and hitting your adult learners where they need it the most. Um, so we take a, a real careful look at our professional development offerings um, and we look at um, it according to levels and our end of year data according to how many professional development opportunities we've had that actually improve instructional quality. So these are ones that are directly related to improving instructional quality. We're pretty tight with how we describe that. So you can see here are some of the things that we said were not um, directly related to instructional improvement. It could be knowledge increasing or foundational skill increasing, but if we couldn't see it in the classroom, then we didn't count it. So you'll see things like um, our PMT training, which is um, making sure that we're careful about when we're managing um, students or handling students. There's a ton of mandated safe schools trainings that really look after protocols of how we deal with uh, you know, hazardous waste and how we deal with um, uh, clean environments. And we have to do those, but we didn't see them translating with an improvement of instructional practice. Um, and then some task things too, like developing a summer reading list or preparation for a systems um, analysis of our practice. So that was uh, one component, but another way that we want to also look at our professional development is by surveying our teachers. So after every professional development day, oops, and that just rolled. Oops, no, did it. Um, after every professional development day, teachers are asked these three questions: How well did the session align to your practice in the classroom? Um, was the instructor well prepared and activities aligned with clear learning objectives? And was the instructor available and helpful? And you can see across the system, we have incredibly strong aligned professional development opportunities. Um, that is uh, a huge response usually that we get. We usually get, you can see February, we got 171, um, 138 in March. 93 in April, but our averages over time are incredibly high. So that means the time's well spent and the dollars are well spent. Um, here's a T2, you'll see uh, intrinsic motivation of students and staff. Um, you heard me mention that with P8, and actually in our next meeting you'll see how those collapse. That was one of our recommendations. Um, Leadership capacity at all levels of the district, we really wanted to look at our teacher evaluation plan and there's a descriptor called collaboration with colleagues and every teacher has to do a self rating on that and their evaluators have to um, give an overall rating in that domain. Um, so we wanted to see how teachers were rating themselves on this particular domain. So you could see in order to be accomplished, the teacher has to work collaboratively to interpret and use student work and data to inform instruction. Uh, the teacher needs to inter interact professionally with colleagues, demonstrating respect and consideration for all members of the professional community, and the teacher's prepared productive contributor in, collective, in collaborative settings. Um, so that's our indicator. And our overall average on the district was a 3.3, which means over that standard and approaching the, um, the next highest standard or the highest standard. 
the other um, indicators are actually just numbers, they're not links. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we were using transparent financial practices. Um, one of the indicators of that was the number of voters passing the school budget, which was 63%, and the percentage complete against our communication plan. And that is one of our initiative charters. And we were 10% complete against that communication plan. But I know already this year we've made more strides <laughs> on communication. Thank you, Zoe. <laughs> Um, and another piece we wanted to actually keep track of is um, how our resources were funded when we um, were looking at priority initiatives. So 100% of our priority initiatives were funded last year through the budget, and that goes through the guidelines and the objectives. So 100% of those um, that the budget was developed on were actually funded by um, the adoption of the budget. So that's a lot of information. It'll go out on the website. I hope it gave you a helpful overview so of all the different measurements we keep track we of. We wanted to split up. Gail, just go back to the strategy map. Okay. And can I bother you, Gail, to maybe send this slideshow digitally to the board? Yeah, yeah. yeah it'll take me a little time because it's all in Google Docs. Yeah. yeah. It's it's all takes even even, one, it's hard even the me. explaining slides doesn't have to, because that's already up there, right? On the, on the this online. one, yeah, yeah, this is online, but it doesn't fall neatly to the other. Thank so. you. So, Gail and I imagined that the top three, the student parent, the community, the board of ed, those stakeholder pieces we think would be of most interest and they could be boiled down most simply. We wouldn't anticipate going through this part, which is all the process um, of getting to those top three, but we want to do one pass through just so the board knows all the work that's going on in the background. There's a lot of work. This plan is a heavy, heavy lift. Strategic plan is a heavy lift. We think it's valuable, the team thinks it's valuable, um, but we just wanted to kind of walk through the process piece here. Um, we would imagine the stakeholder outcomes are where the board's interests probably lie the most. So we want to come back next meeting um, and just make some recommendations for some changes. Uh, obviously the communication one is a big one. Mm -hmm. We want to set forth some initiatives around that work. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, any board member feedback uh, at that meeting as well, we can incorporate. <coughs> G Gail, to Katie's request for those of us who have failed miserably at trying to download any presentation from the website could you make a hard copy and maybe put it in my mailbox she did uh, at the last meeting you had a yellow folder yeah we got it that was now printed I'll give you another show them <laughs> thank you yeah no problem oh. Emily. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I will try to um, figure out a way to link those pieces in a meaningful way to send to all of you. We, we didn't want to make you feel out of place. We gave everyone our mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> 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 I, I have no problem with my ignorance being singled out. <laughs> um, any other questions? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Other matters? Okay, we're going to need one. Yeah, I'm going to switch it up. Okay, got it. Didn't want them to see the ugliness behind you. Understood. Do we have any other ones? Um, no, I think that was Okay. Um, board member comments? So I just want to thank Becky and uh, Mrs. Frost um, for hosting tonight. I want to, um, I know this is a little awkward setup. Um, but I really felt like it was important, given the work that went into the various schools um, in the district over the summer, that it was uh, a good idea to take our show on the road and um, get a first-hand look at um, all the work that's gone on. So thank you for hosting us, yeah, happy and happy. thank you for all putting up with, you know, having to see us. But we will go back to the Hammond Asset Room. Um, <laughs> um, and that was my only update. Um, so moving on to committee reports. Curriculum and student development. Yep, I will read um, our last report from Galen, who's not able to be here tonight. So the Curriculum and Student Development Committee met last week. We discussed the Polson Chemical Hygiene Plan. Uh, we went over the updated manual for Polson, and the plan will be up for adoption by the full board on October 8th. We also met with Stacy Daly and Jen Maxwell, who discussed the benefits of a pilot program around illustrative math for grades six through eight. The current Bridges program 
um, only covers grades K through five. Carol Sullivan will lead in the professional development for grades six through eight. We also discussed SVAC test familiarity for math grades three through eight. EduPlan at links and resources on increasing the students' familiarity with the SBAC are available for teachers to incorporate with minimal disruption into their lesson plans. Some items will be phased in throughout the year and others will be offered in the three-week period prior to the test. We discussed ELA grammar revisions to use <coughs> units K through 9. A couple are on the agenda for tonight, including literature to film revisions and grammar. And we finally discussed the, um, a little bit of tonight's standardized testing report as part of the strategic plan. End of report. Thank you. Communications. No report. Facilities. All right, so uh, we're going to have a lengthy report tonight because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a presentation on the big vote that we're going to have. Uh, we're going to have an action item later um, on the agenda for uh, the moving the adoption of the facility committee's um, proposal for facilities renewal uh, that the facilities committee voted on and passed unanimously on uh, September 12th. So um, what we'd like to do is uh, Tom's going to make a presentation mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to make a brief statement and then we're going to open it up to discussion and, um, and just kind of <coughs> talk it out and see what people's issues Concerns and questions are. How are we doing, Gail? Um, we're we're coming along. Okay. Coming along. <laughs> See, it's not just you, Kirk. You, so you know what? While you're doing that, so <laughs> I'll I'll start with the Thanks, Katie. the brief statement I was going to make, which is really just thanking everybody who got us here. Um, Tom will go through in the presentation the long road uh, that has been you know over five years now um, on facilities renewal uh, for the town. Um, I, I want to uh, thank the Tri-Board Working Group uh, and Kirk Barnaby, our able, maybe he's not a computer whiz, but uh, he's a very excellent leader um, who uh, spent a lot of his time and invested his time into, um, into uh, chairing that Tri-Board Working Group. I want to thank the Boards of Selectmen and Finance. Uh, and the Board of Ed for participating in the Tri-Board Working Group. Um, I, it was a tremendous lift, it was a lot of work, and it was done very well, and it served our facilities committee well. Uh, we had a lot of documentation that you guys had prepared that we were able to go through, um, and a lot of concepts that you had pre-thought about um, and worked through that we were able to then um, take up. So I'd like to thank the facilities committee, Galen Cauley, Greg DeSantis and our ex officio member Katie Stein. Um, I would like to uh, give a big hearty thanks to the administration, uh, Superintendent Scarice, who was uh, very instrumental in all of the public fora that we had. Um, we had a tremendous uh, showing of public um, input, and Tom guided those sessions very well. I'd like to thank Bill McMinn, our facilities director, for yeoman's work. Um, just did a tremendous amount of work on facility stuff, um, which you would expect since he's the facilities director. Um, <laughs> Stacy Nobitz, uh, our finance director, has been tremendous as well in giving us um, feedback and, and guidance on uh, all the financial matters. I know she's hiding behind the bookcase somewhere <laughs> over there. Um, Wendy uh, Brigindi, our board clerk, has been very helpful as well. And I'd also like to give a special thank you to our uh, primary consultant, Colliers International. Uh, we are very lucky to have a nationally renowned um, school facilities expert uh, company that uh, is able to consult for us. And uh, with that, now that everything's now loaded, loaded up, up, we're loaded. Um, so I'll look at clicks. Okay. So up enough clicks. On behalf of the facilities committee, I just have some background slides to hopefully start the discussion. So three pieces tonight. Uh, just a very brief overview of the history and process for <coughs> folks who maybe are, have been following um, the actual recommendation from the facilities committee, and then just a, a slide or two on the cost, and then the offsets embedded in that cost. Um, so in 2014, uh, on the heels of an elementary study, uh, a facility in 2010 that, that really was not moved forward for a variety of reasons, 
uh, the board started a comprehensive facility study uh, and it culminated in 2017 with a, a referendum failure uh, in September and then the board decision uh, in action to based on declining enrollment to um, if it, uh, rearrange and reconfigure the district and contract to five schools which we have done starting this school year 2018 um, over the course of that school year the board adopted a 10 plus year maintenance plan and that maintenance plan is really just to account for the systems of the district uh, HVAC windows doors those basic systems um, this was a result of the failure of the referendum because those problems that we were trying to solve didn't go away so that 10-year maintenance plan was adopted by the board in June of 2018, but then the next month after that, all three primary boards in the town, finance, select, and education met, agreed to start a task force to study the alternatives as opposed to that 10-year plan, and that's where the tri-board uh, school facilities working group began. Uh, they met from October 17th to April 3rd. It reads like a headstone. Um, <laughs> 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 feels like a headstone. No. Sorry, sir. Yeah. <laughs> like, geez, I didn't realize that. I threw it on my computer. Okay. Uh, goal was just to work collaboratively among the three boards, identify options beyond the Board of Ed plan, that 10 year maintenance plan. The problem did not go away. We have aging facilities, we have mounting maintenance projects. There was a lot of community engagement, as Seth had uh, commented. There are three public forums. Um, two of which were the highest attendance in, in my eight years that I've seen over 80 people at the public forums and very, very active. Um, folks didn't realize when they showed up they were working. They got stickies, they were all along the room, and we ran it like we run our admin council meeting. <laughs> um, we had meetings with realtors. Um, we had some very key stakeholder presentations. We had Austin from the Senior Center. We had Scott Cock from Youth and Family Services and a whole slew of, uh, of guests as we met every Wednesday for the better part of six or seven months. Uh, I had a couple of brown bag lunches with some folks that uh, also offered some contributions. Um, in 2019, uh, last May, um, the Facilities Committee took the final two recommendations from that tri-board working facilities group and um, met over the course of uh, May 21st and May 12th. Um, quite a I'm sorry, May 21st, September, September 12th. 12th. Yes, <laughs> yes. A um, uh, number of facility committee meetings over the summer and the beginning of the school year. And then finally, last week on the 12th, there was a committee vote for a recommendation of a renewal plan uh, that's considered for action tonight by the Board of Education. And that's an action item on your agenda for later on. This report is just to frame that vote for later on uh, and to start that discussion. What is the recommendation? It's a four school model. Uh, the projects that reduce the footprint from five schools to four, what it looks like is a, uh, a new construction of a pre-K to five on the Green Hill campus. Um, we would convert also a project, um, a Brown Intermediate School, to a K to five school. And uh, the four school model projects would also include renovations at Polson Middle School. Um, as you know, Polson, we've talked about a number of times, has a lot of interior classrooms and they do not have access to, to fresh air and windows. So this would address the air quality in the building, the HVAC systems, which are a lot, um, as Bill would say, are probably original to the building, Bill. Some of them, yes. Okay. We would also look at renovations to the auditorium and a pretty healthy investment there uh, to bring that up to modern day standards. And then uh, finally, security enhancements. So we would look at addressing uh, entranceways and hardening the exterior further uh, for security enhancements. So the recommendation that was voted on by the Facilities Committee encompasses the four school model, and these are the primary projects that are in that model. Uh, there are offsets and costs involved here. So the cost of the four school model projects, so those projects right there, uh, the new construction, the conversion of Brown to a K-5, and the Pulson renovations, um, it, this is an estimate. And I gotta make it very clear, and Kirk and I talked at length this afternoon, <laughs> It's tough putting numbers up here because we do not have, um, as Bill would say, you know, a deep, deep analysis that we can, you know, say those are the confirmed numbers. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, and until we do that study. But we do have approximations, and they're good industry standard approximations because you look at square footage of what you're trying to build. You have industry standards on price per square foot, so they're very fair numbers, but they definitely could be altered over time. I would imagine by scope. And probably the biggest task we have ahead of us is education specifications. So when you develop the ed specs, that drives a lot of the cost of the building because that drives programming space. So these are initial numbers. 
But what this does is uh, the four school model projects on the prior page there, it takes a lot of the capital maintenance 10 year plan off the table and it reduces that to 44 million, which was over 100 million or 100 million over 10 years. And the total price. percent reduction. 56% reduction from the original maintenance plan. Um, and the board members can all talk about what, what that benefits the town, um, the facilities committee, I'm sorry, can talk about that. What are the offsets? Um, there's an operations and maintenance savings here. Um, it, it calls for the closure of Jeffrey School, it calls for the closure of Ryerson School, and it calls for the closure of the Town Campus Learning Center Preschool. So those have, those three buildings have operation costs, obviously, but also maintenance costs in that 10 plus year maintenance plan, those would go away. Um, so this is the plan the Facilities Committee had adopted um, after a, a lot of consideration. Um, but the seeds of it come from the Tri-Board Working Facilities Group, which began their work last October. And I think what the Facilities Committee probably would emphasize is that work began across the three primary boards of the town. So that's it for my portion. Um, and the Facilities Committee members, um, I'm sure, would like to articulate their thoughts on uh, what they voted for, why they voted for it, and I'm sure there's plenty of questions and comments. I have a question about the modulars. Do we sell them? What do we do with those? If we would give them back to the town, you would no longer need them. If you would, the Board of Education would make a vote that they don't need the facility anymore, just like they did the other schools, and it gets it back to the town, and then the town would make the final decision on what happens to the building. So that would be the town campus has modulars, Jeffrey has modulars, right? Yes. Okay. So did I. Um, I, I have a yeah. Okay. Thank you. How does the town vote on this? Does it vote on it as a referendum all on in one chunk, or do we vote each time we want, like for the 84.8 million, each of those projects gets bonded separately, right? Yeah, the goal is um, to have a, a unified plan approach right. and have one big bang referendum the where the whole. town gets to determine and there will be more information available to the town about the specific phasing of the project so that the town will understand that we're not taking all the bonding out in year one it's going to be you know a smooth bonded Right, but so they vote on a referendum for 128 million. No, no, no. no. Can we ask since we have Stacy here? Yeah, can, can we ask, can yeah. we just get her input on yeah. that too? Sorry. Can we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hot seats here. Thanks, Stacy. Um, <laughs> can you also <laughs> add to that if there's a reference when that takes place? So I believe the recommendation is to move forward. You can't talk behind it. <laughs> 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 move forward. She's hiding. In case I believe the anything. recommendation is to move forward with an 84. Point nine million dollar referendum, and that that is what is going to go to the voters in May. Right. And then, as far as drawing down that all that debt service is going to be spread out as far as the cash flows that Collier's provided us and what we need as far as drawing down. So we're not going to draw down on eighty four million yeah. immediately. Yeah. That's going to be spread out. Right. And all my projections are spread out based on the cash flows. But currently, the committee recommended putting forward the full 84.9 million to referendum. And then the 44 million would be part of the CIP each okay. year. That Correct. Not, so it's just part of the overall. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so knowing pay as you go. Yeah. Pay as you go, but knowing how CIP functions, there is no way that CIP can pay as you go 44 million. So eventually, we may need to go out again for another bond referendum. But currently, all that's on the table right now is 84.9 and then we'll figure out the 44 million. As a debt service declines, we can work that all in. And with everything else that's going on within the town. And that's not different than how we've been behaving since we've adopted the 10-year the maintenance plan, um, with the CIP looking at projects as they come in terms of what we can afford this year. Yes. Right, but we are supposed to put five years into the plan. We only put one year in Right, year. so we will we, be able to do this yeah. once we know what schools we're paying attention to with the renewal plan. So, so from what I understand, though, in this proposal, there's also attached to it, and Seth, you can probably expand on this, is a five-year CIP pay-as-you-go that will be attached to this $84.9 million bond referendum and then a five-year pay-as-you-go that will be submitted <coughs> to the committee after tonight. And it's 44 million is part of the 
Correct. Yeah, that's, that's over 10 years. years. Part of the 44. The, the yes. 44 million is, goes out over the 10 years. Yeah, I understand. And, okay. And yeah. so we're going to... Five years of that will be yeah. presented as a five-year plan to the CIP. One other thing that it's probably important to point out is that the committee also worked to smooth out the 44 million yeah. over the 10 years because yeah. there were some noticeable spikes yeah. left. Mm -hmm. So there were some things that were moved, especially <coughs> to future years so that we had sort of a relatively smooth between one million and five point something million for any given year of uh, the 10 year plan rather than all of a sudden it's 10 million next year, it's 800,000. Yeah. So there's some move around there too. And is the Polson part of the bond, the referendum, the 80 some, the Polson pieces? So the Polson, can we go back the to auditorium, the auditorium? The auditorium, the auditorium security, security and, and the HVAC. 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 Yes. That's yes. part of the um, 80s. For Polson, so yeah. that's, I think it makes up 20 million of the 84. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a substantial amount of work put into our building that needs mm -hmm. the most work that will be left uh, standing. And I, I would just like to add too, I think starting with the tri-board committee, I mean, you probably all remember hearing about it, that there were 60 plus different options that mm -hmm. everything from a monorail mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. to the Scaris mm -hmm. ice rink yeah. um, were in some of the um, plans that were presented. And little by little, unfortunately, because of fiscal obligations, you know, we had to kind of pick and choose what would give us the most bang for our buck and what would, um, you know, really renew the systems or the buildings that we have in a footprint that we can um, live in. And so I recognize that this does not check every box that um, we would like to have checked. But I also feel like it's a fiscally attainable, and I think that's just as important as part of what both the tri board and our facilities committee had to look at. Um, and so, does it doesn't get us necessarily completely over the finish line? But I think it's a really good start at making a footprint that will bring us to the 21st century. And in addition to that, um, we started with the tri board 4.4a option. Um, but as a committee, um, we reconsidered input from the town, from stakeholders, from administration, from our um, from colliers, our consultant, um, you know, talked about potential, you know, uh, likelihood of passage at referendum. We took up, you know, what else is going on in town and other projects that are looking to be done. We took a lot of that stuff into account. Um, and and added ended up adding um, kind of modifying the 4.4a uh, plan to take account of constituencies parity um, busing um, you know other projects in town it, we really took a holistic approach um, and and tried to hammer out the best plan we could where we could get the most bang for the most valuable um, buck you know, it's, ve it's a value-oriented plan. Yeah, along those same lines, I just want to say, as a member of the committee who's seen a lot of great work come out of Tri-Board, one of my concerns at that Tri-Board meeting that we had some months ago was that we would tackle everything as a town, and we would, we would perpetuate this cycle where we are fixing all the problems of the town, and then we do nothing for a very long time and let it build up again. And then we have a million things to fix again and, and, and get into, like, a weird pattern of, both finance and but also projects and things like that. So one of the reasons that I voted for this is that it addresses the K-5 needs in particular. And we know that that's a major pressing need and also reduces the number of facilities that we have to maintain and provides us with one new facility mm -hmm. and one converted, upgraded facility. That means that um, it'll be hopefully another 50 years maybe before you have to build another K-5, especially uh, the one that might be on the Green Hill campus. So that was attractive to me. Additionally, I think Polson as being our biggest need overall, got some very necessary renovations built into this. Um, and one concern for me is that the high school's not here. So I, I just want to raise that here as, you know, what, what does that do for those students? But um, Galen's not here tonight, but he and I have had a conversation about hearing at both policy committee and at curriculum and student development committee that 
there have, as Tom described earlier, already been a lot of changes to high school curriculum, high school uh, pedagogy over the last 15 years. It's a different environment than it has been. And we're about to head into some significant changes to graduation expect expectations for high school students. So I wouldn't be surprised if five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever it is, as we get into that, we might say there are some projects that need to happen at the high school. And hopefully we get to the point where that's maybe beyond some of the heaviest years of you know, bonding, bonding debt service. and debt service for this particular project. So I think there are other things besides the, uh, the 84.9 and the 44 million on the horizon, in the distant horizon, but I think that this hones in on what we need to tackle right now and what we can tackle right now. I have a question about the auditorium. Is that going to accommodate our graduating classes and if we need an indoor ceremony versus, I mean, we've always had wonderful weather and we're really lucky. And we'll continue to have wonderful weather. <laughs> <laughs> I am so yeah, Especially this year. Yeah. That's one of the bullet points. <laughs> Sunny graduation yeah. yeah. um, hasn't been discussed. Hasn't been discussed. Okay. Certainly could be, but it hasn't been discussed. Okay, I, I'm sure that's How many some. kids? But, are but we did, from? although, we, I'm sorry, just to s stick with this answer first. Um, we did consider the fact that the uh, Polson Auditorium is one of the primary meeting places for the town. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would make sense to have. In order to, from my perspective, this was not part of the vote, okay. but from my perspective, um, it would make sense to have um, a larger auditorium than we currently have, a larger footprint. Um, and, you know, one thing that I considered was maybe even the high school students um, can rehearse at the high school and have their production um, at the Polson Auditorium if it's a big, you know, I also want to clarify, though, that in terms of the facilities committee work that will continue, good luck, Kirk, um, is that the not only are the numbers not final, they're, they're, they're excellent estimates, but they're not the final number that we'll necessarily see on uh, the referendum. The specifics of the plan are also not final. So okay. being able to say, you know, this is what how many seats the auditorium is going to have, or this is how many classrooms that are going to be in the new K-5 construction, we don't, okay. we don't know exactly yet. That We're at the point where we're going to, the facilities committee will begin to get that information um, in more detail now that there's a general construct. I'm sure there'll be lots of input. So wait, if the That's numbers good. aren't final, we're just this voting on the option? Proof of concept, yeah. and, and because we're, we're at the point now where we're going to have to do some studies. Right, which, right. Uh, so right. getting an endorsement from the board to move and so then there will be another vote on the final number before it goes to review. Well, this for this vote will then go to the boards of selectmen and finance. And by the time the boards of selectmen and finance need to take action, um, will hopefully the results of studies will be coming in. We'll be able to finalize numbers. Yeah, the board of finance isn't going to want to see it without real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> the biggest driver is the specs. We just um, had a proposal for the specs. Once that's done. Then we'll be able to fine tune the number on the new construction. But do we think it's fairly close? I mean, you oh, would want to vote yes. on this and then have it come back two hundred and fifty million. No, no it's, <laughs> a very, it, well, it's it's a yeah. very close planning number. Is how I would yeah. okay. categorize it. It's, it's definitely it. within range of man, the order of magnitude, mm -hmm. um, but even narrower than that, it's a good planning number. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to part, right? yeah. we have so break down each of those three. It's a it's a good mm -hmm. question. Um, in the first one. We have a really good order of magnitude number. Um, I think better than that because it's price per square foot by Collier is based on you know what they're doing out in the field, mm -hmm. based on actual projects right now. So that first one's a pretty solid number. And it's the new building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the um, I'm going to go to Paulson for a second. The Paulson renovations is largely based on a 10-year maintenance plan, which Bill did an incredible mm -hmm. dive into with Collier's and got a lot of comparable projects that were out in the field right now. Um, and they have escalators in them, so if we did them three to five to seven years from now, there's an uh, understanding of what that would include. There's no scope around the auditorium to your question before Violet. Yeah, I'm that's sure a good question, be really, because the scope could be like it's yeah. Broadway theater, you know, the scope can be, you know, a, a variety of things. Um, the security enhancements are also uh, baked into the maintenance plan. The conversion of Brown. Uh, we went out for RFP, the facilities cleaning doses, and we will have good numbers on that, I would say, by late November. 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 By November, yeah. So it will come into clearer focus. And the other thing we did to come up with the 84.9 number 
was um, when we voted as a committee, we um, made an assumption about what the Brown School renovation will cost, and then we uh, we added a, a cushion and we capped it. So you know we that's how it you know you make assumptions whatever we capped it on purpose so that way we'd be able to contain a number. And just one, I'm oh, sorry, I'm full of questions. Yeah. How many kids are in that K through five school? In UK? what is that school going to hold? Top of my head right now, we have enrollment projections for this would be five years from now. So mm -hmm. we have you know the birth rates and, and so forth. Um, Bill, do you remember? 700? Is it that? 500? I think it's in the five. Yeah, it's more. Five, it's five, five, six, five. Five. So it's half of the enrollment in town. Half of the enrollment. Yeah. So are the, is there because room to the grow? I, I think my concern is every time we, I know we close, close. the school, but yeah. the only economic growth this town seems to approve is more people moving in, yeah. which means yeah. more kids, which yeah. means more services, which is sort of counterintuitive. Yeah. So I just would want to make sure that we would have enough room to put extra kids if they, you know. You, you and a couple of board members who were around for the 17 referendum may recall that when we looked at um, new constructions, the uh, kind of the Google map view had like a dotted line of where, yeah. and the fact it's a two-story building gives you twice as much. Okay. Um, so there, that that would be an expectation that we would have that built in okay. because once we go to four schools, then That's if it. you get a wave. Yeah. Right. So I had another question <coughs> as well about this um, uh, brown converting from intermediate to. We just spent a fortune on our playground. Are mm -hmm. we going to bring from the other town campus our playgrounds? I mean, is, are we going to be? No, no, no we're talking about this. Yeah. What's wonderful yeah. about <laughs> that is that it's playground is actually done for five-year-old to twelve-year-old. Okay, because okay, so that would be really upsetting. And we yeah. love it. Okay, <laughs> good. Such a good investment. Okay, we would have to, hear that. We would have <laughs> to add something for the kindergarten program, yeah, yeah. which we've done yeah. before when we moved all the kindergartners back into all the elementary schools. I don't know if you remember, we had the playgrounds and we added a little section for them. Okay. As long as we're not demolishing and saying oh, no. We're no, no, no. Okay. no. Okay. Those the pieces of equipment are all uh, categorized from 5 to 12 years old. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Which is perfect. That is really yeah. That's good. Yeah. Good question. Anybody else have any questions? Comments? There was a question about process before, and I want to just have Stacey kind of articulate wh where this goes and wh how this plays out. Because the question of it coming back to the board, I don't think that's part of the process, correct? Correct. So it, once this is voted on, it will then move on to the first selectman slash board of selectmen, and then ultimately be submitted to the CIP committee on October 15th. So once it goes to the CIP committee, they will work their magic through February 1st, and then it will work through the budget process, through back through the Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, and then the referendum. So. And for CIP, the other thing that we ought to mention is um, after we determined that this would be the plan, we were able to back into the firm one year CIP um, amount. And it was 400 and 415, I think. Yeah, it was 400. We ended up, yeah, it changed a little yeah. bit. I think it was 415 S or 415. So it's $115,401. Yeah. For, for so year one. <laughs> for year one. For year yeah. one. Exactly. And then yep. Years two through five tend to be placeholder. Anyway. Year, you, year two was 1 million. Year two was 1.6. Year four was 4.6. Year five okay. was 4.3. And the only year that we're bound to for the pay as you go is year one. Right. So what? Once you vote tonight, this will go um, forward to CIP as well as the next five years, um, which will include the 415 for the first year. And if everything's approved, that 415 will be approved through the pay as you go, and then the referendum will move forward as it for the 84.9. Years two through five will still be in there for planning because things change, um, but it'll be there should the referendum not go through. The backup plan of the original CIP maintenance, 10 year maintenance plan that you all approved will also be included in the document. So then we'll have to go back and review that. The important point about years two through five is what you see up here is this four school model is September of 2024, correct? Yes. This is a long time from now. So we have capital projects in our Keep current going. buildings that we would hope to not have to address and be an offset. Um, however, 
you know, it's important in those years two through five that we may have to address some. Uh, right. And uh, just another thing I'd like to say about the value. Um, you know, we all know what's going on in neighboring in neighboring towns, and we like to talk about the Madison way of doing things, and we like to think that, um, you know, we measure twice and cut once. If you look at what's happened in either town to either side of us, um, Clinton and Guilford, they have many building needs, and they built a huge, expensive high school and didn't touch any of their other schools. And they spent more than we're proposing to spend, and they only got one building done. And it wasn't. Well, I think, well one exactly. was 110 million. No. All right. Well, and they're having trouble passing. Well, they're also having trouble passing um, operating, budget. operating budgets. So what we're trying to do here is for a very reasonable cost, we're going to get a whole new school, two like improved schools with good improvements, and smooth out a lot of the other stuff. And our <coughs> school stock will be younger, and our maintenance, therefore, going forward, will be hopefully less of a burden. So we think it brings a tremendous amount of value for uh, what we be recommending for referendum. What I, Stacey, do you, this is not a board of it. I just, do you know where we'd be competing, we're kind of competing against in the spring with other town referendums? Which other projects are like is cool. Academy going and start Academy. Like both? So yeah. currently right now, because because we're pulling CIP together after tonight, um, we do have all the pays you go and then um, the Academy and then this proposal as of right but now. But they'll be separate questions. You That's a board of selectmen yeah. decision. Not I've heard yet. that yeah. they they will be, but okay. it has not been finalized. A board of selectmen needs to vote on that. And just one more point that I want to make is part of you know the importance of, of having a full board, um, you know, endorse this or not tonight is that you know we're we're somewhat delinquent on our CIP <laughs> um, for Stacy, so we've got to kind of know what our landscape looks like so that we can um, make. Right there. Well, having lived through the last referendum and that whole process, I mean, this is these are bigger schools for the same amount of money we were going to do for a new Ryerson and a renovated Jeffrey. Now you're getting a new pre K through five mm -hmm. and a renovated Brown for, for more kids and Wilson. And Wilson yeah. So, I mean, it's a yeah, I mean, no, I value, but it's a good use, it's a good use of the funds. <laughs> I just want to clarify one thing about the vote that we will eventually have tonight. Um, <laughs> that is to move forward both the 4.4, what we're seeing here, the 89, <coughs> 84.9 million, and also the CIP, uh, 10 year or the five years of CIP. Is that right? We're moving both of those tonight. Yes. Yeah. With, 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 one one yes. with one vote. With one vote. With one vote. I just want to make sure. It's both Everybody's of those things together. That. Yeah, the plan that we're presenting as a facilities committee includes the CIP. Yeah, the I, yes. I think the action item should be clarified if that's the case. Katie. Parliamentarian, if you would like to work on that language on. <laughs> until we get there, I would appreciate it. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it during the long finance committee. Okay, report. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so mean. So Any thank you all. Any other questions? Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Finance committee brief. Yes, we have actually started to work uh, <laughs> to uh, Greg's uh, comment. Yes. Uh, and um, tonight uh, we reviewed uh, with Tom and Gail uh, the uh, budget guidelines and assumptions uh, for this uh, this coming uh, school year. Uh, there were no objections to the material presented, so Tom and Gail will now share those assumptions with the broader faculty. And then uh, when that work is completed, it will come back to the Finance Committee. Uh, we will adopt a budget calendar and provide to the Board of Education a draft of the budget assumptions for this coming year. Our expectation is that we'll have that uh, in place at our October 15th meeting. End of report. End of report. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> Very short. Personnel committee. No report. Policy. Uh, policy met tonight and uh, decided.
discussed a number of things. So the committee discussed policy 3542.4, lunch charging. Uh, the administration presented including policies from other districts and feedback was provided by the committee. Uh, a policy proposal will come back to the committee in October for further review. Uh, the committee discussed policy 6146, graduation requirements. The administration provided an overview of necessary policy changes based on shifts in state statute. And the committee unanimously voted to move the revised policy for first reading at the October 15th board meeting. So you'll see that pretty soon. Um, the committee discussed policy 5120.3.4, which is management plan and guidelines for students with food allergies, glycogen storage disease, and or diabetes. Uh, the administration provided an overview of the Shipman and Goodwin version of the policy, uh, which you'll see is a trend here for the next couple, and recommended replacement of the current policy with the Shipman version. And the committee again unanimously voted to move the revised policy for a first reading on October 15th. Uh, the committee discussed policy 5144.4, physical exercise and discipline of students. We've seen that recently, but uh, the administration provided an overview of the Shipman and Goodwin version of the policy and recommended replacement of the current policy with the Shipman version. Again, the committee unanimously voted to move forward the policy for first reading on October 15th. There is one new policy, uh, also moving forward to October 15th uh, unanimously, which is sunscreen application in school. Uh, again, the administration provided an overview of the Shipman and Goodwin suggested policy and recommended adoption of that version. There is new state statute requiring that we have such a policy. So you'll see that on October 15th. And then finally, we discussed the uh, cycle for annual policy review. Uh, just as a reminder, we agreed on a six-year cycle of policy review at a recent policy committee meeting to make sure we're looking at all of our policies holistically. And uh, policies zero through 3999 are out with Shipman and Goodwin, who is reviewing the policies, and the administration will provide updates to the committee on any suggested, suggested revisions uh, as they arrive. End of report. Oh, not end of report. We do have one thing on here, and it's not mentioned in, under the personnel committee, uh, policy committee, at least on my version. We have a third read tonight uh, for policy 5060, registration for school, which again is just clarification of what actually happens compared to what we had written down in policy. We have received no feedback on that policy uh, as a committee. End of report now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, learn liaison. Yes, the Learn Board of Directors met on September 12th. The new executive director reviewed the agency goals, which I will just <coughs> list for you, for those of you who are <coughs> familiar with Learn, to provide exemplary, innovative, and equitable school-based programs that advance achievement for all students and nurture the cognitive, physical, and emotional well-being of students in safe, respectful, rigorous, and diverse learning communities to provide expertise, leadership, and innovative programs and services that build regional capacities and supports, to create equity in education and positive outcomes for all students, and finally, to provide cost-effective, customized, organizational, and operational services for their members. She also presented a reorganization of the agency, and they also updated the board of directors that they have a newly established communications team Oh. Yep, people are getting on that wagon, whose mission is to improve messaging to both internal and external customers, mm -hmm. as well as to help districts in communications. Um, finally, some items on their roundtable were about school start time, superintendent evaluations, and district communications, as well as strategies for getting positive stories and accomplishments out to the public across a wide range of print, email, social media applications, and superintendent weekly newsletters. So very much in line with the work that we've been working on with the That's communications committee and the specialist. Are they looking for later start times? It was just a topic that has come up to discussion <coughs> in their round table. So, yes. End of report. Thank you. Um, audience response? Just, just want to remind people, this would be a time if you have any questions or comments on the uh, facilities or other uh, presentation. So. Could you clarify, uh, you know, as the voters look at the big number, sure. could you do a little bit more clarification of kind of the tranches, how they come down, how the money f is split up over the years? Um, as, far, as far as money, as far as the debt service or the I mean, are you, impact? Are you, you're, you're borrowing $85 million, right? We're borrowing 
over eight short-term notes, okay. I believe. I don't have my, my files over there, um, for long-term bonds. Right. So we draw down as we need it based on the cash flows. We don't draw down before we need it because we don't want to pay interest before we have to. And it's spread out over, I believe, eight different drawdowns. Okay. So I, I have that all that information. I can share that. And again, this is all estimates. Um, back to Happy's point, you know, that's it's all estimates. It's all projections based on cash flows, which is subject to change. But we do have that. We have that spread out. We have that spread out in five-year gaps. We have tax impacts impact um, estimates based on five-year gaps and what the um, projected tax increase could be on five-year gaps. So we do have all those numbers, so I'm not exactly sure what you're looking for, but we've been running numbers all different ways. So if you want to expand, we can certainly provide you with that information. No, not, at, not, at, not at this point. Okay. I just think that a lot of explaining is going to have to go around. That Absolutely. Big number. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot behind all the numbers. The, the other, the other thing that Kirk and I have talked about this a lot. You know, I, I, my kids grew up in Wilton, campus approach. Are there operating efficiencies to having kind of everything down? You know, do, do you know what those are? Have you thought about that? Well, in our public forums that we had, right. I yeah. think that was a major theme was right. security and efficiencies and value um, all um, leading to where we landed. And, the, and this, yeah, and this plan really creates just two campuses, right. whereas we had more, it was more far flung. And the, the campus you're on right now couldn't handle the whole district at this point. Right. Um, and we have a lot of investments also in the school, um, in Brown Middle School as well. I mean, I... I mean, I saw the campus approach work. I think maybe I West, explaining I think how it works is is relatively. I was in West, and we have four schools: K two, three, five, six, eight, nine, twelve, and it is it's a lovely yeah. approach when you can fit it all in one campus. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I need a. Mo uh, motion to adopt the ELA units. Discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion Consent. to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Now I need a motion to uh, adopt ELA units with embedded grammar. So grades K through 9. Is that so you, Happy? Yep. And no second because it came out of curriculum. All our discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I need a motion to adopt grade 12 ELA literature and film curriculum. So moved. And I need a second um, discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I need. Um, so I have a recommended language for this. Oh, wonderful. Uh, see if this fits the need, though. Let's Wendy? make sure. Mm -hmm. So okay. potentially. The, the whole beginning is the same. To adopt for recommendation to the Boards of Selectmen and Finance the facilities renewal option identified as Tri Board Option 4.4A. Mm -hmm. Here's the new part, Wendy. As well as the related five year maintenance plan proposal for CIP. So I'll say that one more time. As well as the related five year maintenance plan proposal for CIP. Sold. Okay. So, let's see if I got it. <coughs> we need a motion to adopt for recommendation to the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance the facilities renewal option identified as Tri Board Option 4.4A, as well as the related five year maintenance plan proposal for CIP. So move. Second. So, no, it doesn't need I'm going to give up my second to set yeah. on that one for sure. And the third. Okay. <laughs> you know it comes out of discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I need. Thank you all. Thank, yes, thank you. Um, I need a motion to approve policy 5060, registration for school. This is the third reading. So moved. Happy that was you. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't need a second um, discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I need a motion to approve um, the change of committee responsibility. So moved. Second? I think we should just discuss and say what that is. Yeah. Well, that's after the second. Yeah. But no, no, now no, no, now yeah. we will discuss. Exactly. Discussion. Um, I had um, two board members ask um, to switch committees um, for convenience purposes as well as areas of interest and they mutually decided it um, between themselves, well, discussed it mm -hmm. between themselves and approached me. Um, it didn't seem to upset the apple cart too much and so I'm just asking for um, board approval to change these comments. <coughs> so Greg will go to <coughs> curriculum and student development and Kirk will go to facilities. Condolences, Seth. <laughs> 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 I'm going to stop with you for another All minute. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I need a motion to approve the provisions of policy 3240, non-resident admission and tuition fees for children of non-resident staff for the 2019-2020 school year. So moved. Second? No, it's from second. Oh, no, it did not. No, it did not. I need a second. Okay. Second. 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 Second from Kirk. This is a further discussion. Can you explain yeah. that what happened? Tom? So we, we voted on that, but Tom, I, just, but, I, here's the just caveat. Before to hand Tom, it over to Tom, we, vo we voted on that last time. It is policy. This is a, a use of policy issue. Yeah, so there's no date in the policy. So technically, we can start this today. Um, we were very clear, though, that we had no intention of starting this until next school year. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I've been very reluctant to message this to the staff or the community until this vote because I would um, like to see us try a pilot with staff only this year. This is not something that we have done historically. Um, we have one district who have a very close colleague who's superintendent of who has had this policy in place. and. Uh, it'd be a good idea for us to begin the pilot. We do have um, the provision in the language for uh, children of anyone employed by Madison Public Schools, and it gives us a good opportunity to begin this for just this school year. And I just want to really emphasize loud and clear, I brought this policy um, about four years ago and then brought this back. Um, we got a little distracted in 2017. Uh, I brought this back um, recently, and it's purely to protect programs. That is the goal. Um, the goal is so that we can maintain enrollment in the district at a certain level. I don't anticipate you know, huge numbers here, but we run the risk if our enrollment drops down below 800 at our high school to run certain of, of our important elective courses, um, maybe some of the arts programs, maybe some of the sports teams we're seeing already. So that's really the, the, the goal of this policy. Again, I don't see huge numbers, but to start this year with staff would be important. So this is. So what are we voting on here? We're voting As on right, so to beginning begin. this yeah, year pilot. for staff only. And the policy allows that, but this is sort of an additional affirmation that the board thinks that that pilot makes sense. And I, and, and I was advised actually by Attorney Mooney to put this to an action item because we were so public about this starting right. next September. Right. Just to clarify it and take action and make sure everybody's all comfortable with it. But the policy itself does not does prevent that. Does, no. Does not pre no, in fact, because it doesn't prevent it, it created this opportunity, but because we publicly started about, right. talked about, That's where we are. you know, sense. making it more public, we wanted just to transparently yeah. say that it would make a lot of sense to start it if there were people that were interested, um, especially um, students of employees, so that they know our district. Exclusive. They know how we work. They know how we run. Not especially. Exclusively. Exclusively right. this year right. for right. staff members, right. um, children to attend. And it would give us an opportunity to pilot the application process, get feedback from them at the end of the year mm -hmm. um, to discuss you know, what works and what didn't before right. we really go live with people from out of town uh, or that don't mm -hmm. already work in the system. And as a policy committee, I don't think we anticipated that there would be interest sort of after the year had started from anybody or the opportunity to market to anybody but if there are staff interested mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm supporting this because I think it's going to be probably a small number of people that probably will teach us more uh, mm -hmm. than it'll cost. Yeah. Exactly. Any other questions? Comments? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Abstain? 
Motion carries. Um, I need a motion to approve a 6,000 donation for field trip expenses to Jeffrey Elementary School by the Jeffrey PTO. So moved. Move. Second. <laughs> um, discussion. Uh, while, while we're here, yes. I want to say in particular thank you very much to the PTO for raising this money and providing it for students uh, for field trips. It's greatly appreciated the board. Uh, appreciates all your efforts. Yes. Thank, thank, you. You, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. I need a motion to approve the minutes of the September 10, 2019 Board of Education meeting. So moved. Second. Um, uh, our discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Um, any old business? Any future agenda items, meetings, and dates of importance are attached. I need a motion to enter into executive session to discuss Board of Education and Superintendent <coughs> goals. Okay. Our future meetings are done at Hammonasset. Our next meeting will be at Hammonasset. Thank you so much. To to I love coming to Jeffrey. <laughs> Sorry, but I still need second a motion. To second. I motion. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>